I'm pleased to sit down today and talk with Bob Manikin, who is the Dean of Commercial Real Estate in the city of Baltimore, very well known, a veteran. Bob, how are you doing today? Oh, as I say, I'm living the pandemic dream. <laughs> I think that's very positive, very much, very good way to say it. Um, well, when you're in commercial real estate, you need to stay positive, especially stay these positive. days. Stay positive. That's the key. Now, we are working on this series, The Future of Cities in General. We had a um, fireside chat with Richard Florida last week. And um, we are also having um, a localized panel looking at it, um, looking at the future for Baltimore. So what do you see? What lies ahead for our city? I think uncertainty lies ahead for our city. Uh, I think a, uh, a challenging office environment lies ahead for our city. I see a lot of positives. Of the the live work play conversion over the last 10 years we have more younger people living in the city in the downtown than ever before we have some statistics that would absolutely boggle your mind with regard to median income and median levels of education in some of the downtown neighborhoods from mount vernon to canton and south baltimore uh, but we've got some real challenges some of which are real estate related some of which are covid related some of which are governance related you talked a lot of uh when we talked last week about pre-existing conditions <laughs> sounds like a health case but also you can apply that term to the city and coming out of covid how are we going to deal with those pre-existing conditions and move into the future well let me spend a minute just to comment on the pre-existing conditions because i think people needed to understand that the downtown office industry uh, was in poor shape even before COVID occurred. Uh, we had rising vacancy rates. We had changes in workplace strategy since 2016 that put more than a half a million square feet back on the market. We've seen, in, seen increasing sublet of space by Transamerica, PNC, and Aon. Uh, we saw the mishandling of the Harbor Place development by Ashkenazi forcing the lender to take over. So we had all of those issues before COVID and we had public safety concerns, increases in crime, some issues, challenges with the police department and a perception that the elected leadership in Baltimore was not capable of addressing the city's issues. All that happened before COVID and now COVID has put the pause on a lot of business. It's put the pause on a lot of people's lives and it's made things a lot more challenging. We're going to have to solve COVID first before we even have a shot at dealing with, I think, the economic development and real estate issues. I know that we're, you know, trying to look and nobody has a crystal ball, so it's hard to figure out which way you go from there. The uh, Downtown Partnership has formed a committee to look at retention and retention of businesses in some of the CBD is a big, um, just a big focus to try to keep uh, from the vacancies from getting even worse. What do you think about retention with a lot of people working from home and there's a, seems to be a, an aura of reset to how people work? Well, there are a couple of things. One, uh, the, the WFH work from home movement uh, is is going to be with us, but studies show, and these are Gensler studies, these are JLL studies, that the overwhelming majority, as much as 46% of the workforce, wants to be in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. Then there's a variation to the extent that 15% don't want to come back. So you're looking at 85% of the workforce that wants to be in an office in one sh way, shape, or form or another. So offices are not going away and we're not all going to start working out of their house of the house for every person who tells me that uh, they just do not go back to the office i have two people lined up that can't wait to get back to the office because they're from a child care issue etc so offices aren't going anywhere the question is what are they going to look like and how much office space are we going to need and where is it going to be located I think Richard Florida was fairly clear that people could work anywhere and remote working made it 
people able to go in, out to the suburbs or the exurbs as opposed to downtown. But he said that downtown is still a huge, that city is still a huge magnet. He did say that, and he really believes in cities as the urban core. And we see a lot of urban suburban, urban being replicated in suburban environments such as Columbia, Owings Mills, uh, Greenlee up in White Marsh. Um, what do you think about the future for those kinds of developments? Do you think we might have more of a regional approach? I, I think we are existing in a regional real estate economy, not only from a office building perspective, but if you look at the sort of the non downtown Baltimore developments, they all have a residential component. Columbia has a residential component. Greenlee has a res residential component in Middle River. Um, Maple Lawn uh, it, 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 in Skagsville has a uh, a residential component because people have seen that you need to have people live near where they work. And quite frankly, Baltimore's residential component has significantly increased in the last 10 to 12 years with the major conversion of about 1.3 million square feet of functionally obsolete Class B office space into apartments, 301 North Charles, 10 Light Street, 120 East Lexington, 10 South Calvert. All of those buildings have been redeveloped. So yeah, there's a regional approach, but within within the region, you're going to have markets with residential, office, and retail, you know, combined. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was thinking about the City Crescent building as well, which is in the conversion stage right now. And um, looking ahead to the future with that and also some of the new um, development for residential that's going up near Lexington Market. Um, do you think the city might have kind of a new spark as soon as we get out of COVID as far as filling up some of those apartments? I think they're slow to lease at this point. Well, we recently did a study for uh, an educational client which basically looked at the multifamily development in downtown Baltimore. And with the exception of the two high-end projects, the Luminary at One Light and 414 Light Street, uh, most of the new multifamily residential development was was leasing quite well. You're looking at uh, vacancy rates less than 10% or occupancy rates in excess of, of 90%. Uh, that coupled by sort of a pent-up demand for, you know, good and better housing in the city, I think, um, it's going to create a lot of opportunities in Jonestown, for example. I know the city has been looking on the southwest corner of Central and Lombard for uh, uh, affordable housing, uh, the Perkins Homes redevelopment. So I think you're going to see potentially a residential renaissance across all spectrums, which is going to be a welcome addition as opposed to just a, a, a subset that's geared at millennials or a subset that's geared at higher end. I think you're going to see a across the board increase. And that, quite frankly, could be a spark, but you're going to need a lot more than that spark to regenerate vitality in the central business district. I know that uh, we looked at some data, you and I, this morning about the um, assessments, the triennial assessments from the state, and they're flat. You know, they, they you know, we have a, a portion of the city that has really high rent, uh, Canton, Federal Hill, part of the CBD, and their assessments came back really flat. What does that say for where Baltimore has to go? And it's kind of a roadmap, isn't it? Um, it can be a bit of a roadmap. Uh, the fact that it the fact that the assessments are flat for office properties is, is really sort of a tale of two cities. Because as you pointed out in Harbor East, I can assure you the assessments are going up significantly. Harbor Point where Exelon is, the assessments are going up. Bond Street Wharf, when you get into Canton, uh, the office assessments there, McHenry Row, those are all very bullish. The problem is in the historic central business district, particularly north of Lombard Street, you've got buildings from the Charles Center era in the 60s, but you have some buildings from the 70s and the 80s that 
have struggled because they cannot maintain uh, a, a, enough lease space, enough occupancy. And what happens is those buildings go into foreclosure. They are sold at a fraction of what it costs to replicate uh, the building if you had to build it, and rents are less, and real estate taxes are less. At the present time, there's a little more than 20% of the traditional Class A vacancy in the Central Business District that's vacant. That's 2 million square feet. Uh, if that if that space was not vacant, all of a sudden you would be seeing three or four dollars a square foot. You could be seeing anywhere from seven to ten million dollars being generated in real estate taxes alone. So one of the challenges the city is going to have is dealing with this oversupply of space, which is not caused by a lot of new development, is really caused more by a lack of demand by some people moving out of the city, some people shrinking the amount of square footage that they need to physically operate in. That's been the problem. And that's why it's important to not only retain business, but develop new businesses, entrepreneurial businesses that can avail themselves of this, what will be relatively inexpensive office space. Yes, and I talk with the governor's office and the, the move or the movement to kind of go towards uh, moving state center into some of that class A and class B space in the CBD is kind of on hold because of the pandemic. What would that do or what could that do for this area? Well, that's the spark you alluded to as it relates to the office building industry. And I say that because it's it Baltimore has not historically attracted large outside users. If you'll notice, in 2001, Morgan Stanley started here in 25,000 square feet. It's now the largest Morgan Stanley operation outside the city of New York uh, with well over 100 to 150,000 square feet. But it started 25,000 square feet. When Pandora came up from Howard County, it was 80,000 square feet. When MAFE came up from Annapolis, it was only 60,000 square feet. Uh, and those were people that were coming from within the state. We have not had uh, a, a strong track record of bringing in a large 100, 150,000 square foot um, outside corporate user. Consequently, a lot of the growth and success Baltimore has experienced has been organic. And so right now, when you have 2 million square feet of space and more space is going back into the market, it's being taken off the market. Anytime that you can get a half a million square feet of office space leased within a 12 month period, you've you've hit a home run with people on all the bases and that's that's a spark that we can use and from a taxpayer point of view it's in our it's our in our self-interest as taxpayers because uh the rental dollar is going to be a lot less expensive than the capital dollar and you're going to have landlords basically saying we'll build the space the way you want it we will furnish it the way you want it you just give us a 15 to 20 year lease and we're in good shape and and it's right it, it it's a good economic development and i'm sorry that it's on hold because of covid because quite frankly uh it's going to take 12 to 18 months under ordinary circumstances to plan and execute such a move anyway and right now from my perspective there's no reason why you could not be on the streets with a request for proposal or a solicitation for offering uh getting the information necessary or starting the process to get the information necessary to do this deal perfect well keep me posted on that because i do expect that to move sometime in the near future and I, 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 I i expect both the elected and the sort of the non-elected leadership of the city and the city hall the downtown partnership gbc I would expect them to all advocate for such a move by the state. That would be a great incentive, definitely. Um, just looking ahead, in um, what will downtown downtown look or feel feel like in a year from now? I know we we're at a new normal. What's it going to look like in your in your view? I I think it, it's going to look a lot more familiar to people than it does now. I think in a year you're going to have 
right now occupancy is running maybe 15 to 20 percent we thought at jll was going to be about 30 percent at this point people are slower they are coming back to offices more slowly but in a year i think you'll probably have anywhere from 50 to 70 percent occupancy so you're going to see pedestrian traffic on the streets you're going to see some stores reopen or restaurants reopen you're going to you're going to see activity that you are not seeing now that's the first thing the second thing is i'd like to think that people are going to start working on harbor place which i cannot emphasize enough is a key element to the the resparking of downtown richard florida talked about those cities on the water that did better than those inland cities we are a city on the water we have a phenomenal harbor inner harbor we are a maritime city that's why it's important for harbor place to be effectively repositioned as quickly as possible because that's going to be part of the the, the renaissance we're going to see in the central business district perfect well, this has been so helpful. It's been great to talk about Baltimore. I know that you're bullish on it, and uh, there is a lot of activity, even though we're stuck inside right now with some snow. But I know that there's a lot of energy. There, there, there is. Uh, look, and, and and again, I will tell you that I thought the Business Journal's uh, program with Richard Florida was one of the best that I have. I've ever participated in because not only does he get it, but he can articulate it. And the point that he made is this is your home that, you know, cities where I, I once represented the, the LBJ foundation, uh, president Johnson daughter uh, was a client and we were flying from Austin, Texas back to Baltimore. And she said, she said, my father taught me whenever I met somebody um, ask, I had to know three things about it. So you're from Baltimore, you're, you're, you know, you've been married for 40 years or whatever, and you're, you're, you're a big North Carolina fan. And she said, why Baltimore? And I looked at her and I said, because it's home. And that's the point Richard was making. And I think that's the that's point fine. that, you know, that, that we should all understand. That's why we do this. You know, we're, you know, I'm, I'm not in commercial real estate because I, I sort of like leasing office space anywhere because it's Baltimore and it's home. So that's why we do it. And that's why I, I, I get energized about it. It's a great old city, isn't it? Historically Absolutely. and in the current Absolutely. time. And it, so. could be, it could be a lot better. It could be a lot better for all of its citizens and not soon enough. And we got to work on that as well. That's great. Thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. This is, your perspectives are so great and spot on. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. Take care Take and care. go O's. <laughs> Be safe and stay healthy and go O's.